Yeah, good, thank you. Hey, good morning. We've had a wild morning so far. <laughs> so make space, because it might be, you know, there might not be any chairs left. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're going to warm up this morning with a song we haven't played in a while, so feel free to stand and join us when you're ready. Good morning. Welcome to Lakeview. We are so glad you came and joined us this morning. I am going to pray as we start worship, so please join me in prayer. Lord, I thank you for today that the sun is shining even though there's more snow on the ground. Lord, come and be in this place, just like the song said, open the floodgates and let your glory pour down. But let us respond in the same way, let us open our hearts and be ready to worship you, worship you through song, worship you in um, 
through the message today, how it can change our hearts and we can go from this place continuing to worship. Let our conversations with one another be encouraging and worshipful to you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. stirs your soul what matters come to mind the kiss you keep the thoughts you think it's not all wasted time seeking you will find Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. Joy still alive and breathing. Praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. Still good news worth repeating. Lift your head and keep singing. finds the child inside we left for growing old awake 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 my soul joy still comes in the morning hope still walks with the hurting you're still and dreaming still good news worth repeating lift your head and keep singing praise the Lord let everything let everything, let everything praise the Lord. Let everything, let everything, let everything praise the Lord. In the working, in the waiting, let it praise the Lord. In the blessing, in the breaking, come on, praise the Lord. In the time. Sunday is a family at worship Sunday and because of that we are going to do a song that we do downstairs for worship it does have motions but I promise there's no jumping this time <laughs> uh, so I'm going to 
tell you how the chorus goes, and then I'm going to explain a few other motions as well. So it's start a fire like you're lighting a match on a matchbox. Start a fire in my soul. Fan the flame and make it grow. Because there's no doubt or denying. Let it burn so brightly so everyone around can see that it's you, that it's you that we need. Start a fire in me. A couple other things. When we start, it's going to be this world is cold and bitter. Feels like we're in the dead of winter and we're going to pull on our thick winter hats. We all know how that feels because we had to do it this morning. Um, there's another part um, that talks about faith and we're looking in the distance for those promises and bear the name. We're sticking on our, our name tag that says Jesus because that's the name we want to bear. So, we ready? Yeah. yeah, let's. There's some more motions, but I'll be up here. We'll do it together. It'll be fun. This world can be cold and bitter. Feels like we're in the dead of winter, waiting on something better. But am I really gonna hide forever? Over and over again, I hear your voice in my head. Let your light shine, let your light shine for all to see. And start a fire in my soul, fan the flame and make it grow. So there's no doubt. Denying. Let it burn so brightly Everyone around can see That it's you, that it's you that we need Start a fire in me Looks really good You only need a spark to start a whole place It only takes a little faith Let it start right here in this city Walls will never be the same Over and over again I hear your voice in my head They need to know I need to go Spirit, won't you fall on my heart now Start a fire in my soul Fan the flame and make it grow So there's no doubt or denying That it burns so brightly Everyone around can see that it's you, that it's you that we need to start a fire in me. You are the fire, you are the flame, you are the light on the darkest day. We have the hope, we bear your name, carry the news that you have come to say. So there's no doubt or denying that it burns so brightly that everyone around can see that it's you, that it's you that we need to start a fire in me. You are the fire, you are the flame, you are the light on the darkest day. Start It's good to be a family, isn't it? Yes, Lord, thank you. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou Two words. 
you can have a seat. One thing we also want to add to our family worship services is I made these folders. So kids, if you are in K through 5 and you didn't grab one, you can go grab one out there. And there are Sharpies to put your name on them. And inside, I made you a little punch card here. Because each time you fill out and take some notes or draw pictures of things you heard in service today, I'm going to give it a punch. And when you fill it up, you will get a prize. We are trying to help our kids learn what it looks like to uh, intently listen to the sermons and the things so they can also grow in their spiritual life. I have some announcements as well. There are a few tickets left for the Men's No Regrets Conference. Mark Krijan has all of those details, as well as our uh, Remove the High Places. We'll, we'll have a get-together. You can get your book and see what it looks like on January 30th after, uh, in the evening, and we'll get together and we'll talk about and get ready for those 63 days that we are going to go on together, that journey. Now, Pastor Josh, I blanked on his name. Josh is not here today. It's because I never call him Pastor. Josh is not here today. He had COVID, so he did record his sermon for us, so we are going to watch that now. probably tell I can't be there with you all this morning. My family and I tested COVID, uh, positive for COVID this week and uh, we're feel, still not feeling very well. Uh, so while I hate preaching to a cell phone in an empty room, uh, I'm glad that I have this option. It's my joy to still get to open God's word with you anyway. So go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to spend some time there and then we're going to over into Matthew chapter 4 and finish out the rest of our time there. We're at that uh, time of the year when we would normally have our annual State of the Church address where we share what we believe God is calling our church family to uh, for the year ahead. But this year is a little bit different. We're actually going to take the next three weeks to share where we feel the Lord is calling us as a church family. We want to give a lot of time to it this year. Uh, today's sermon is actually the first of three of a three-week series called Dear Church. As we look at the New Testament, 22 of the 27 books are letters to churches and sometimes to individuals in specific cities. So the letter of Romans is written to the church family in Rome, likely a, a couple of house churches that meet in different people's homes scattered across the city. With each of these letters, the Holy Spirit inspired the author to give these churches and individuals direction to help them pursue God's calling on their lives. Have you ever stopped to wonder, what might it look like if God were to write a letter to us here at Lakeview Church? Like, what would he commend us for? Where might God rebuke us or, or challenge us? Where might he call us to, to be careful when it comes to our doctrine? What would, he, uh, what would he have to say about our witness to the world, about the things that we value, about the things that we love, about the things that we support? What will be his next steps for us as we try to walk in faithful obedience to him? Well, as the elders have prayed and listened for the Holy Spirit and heard how the Spirit is stirring in many of your hearts, we think the Lord has given us some, some great clarity about what he wants to do in and through us in the years ahead. With this series, Dear Church, we're filling in a bit of the direction that we believe God has given to us and how we are going to pursue that, uh, that calling of God on our life together. We want to give this ample time uh, because... We, we don't think that we're, these are just neat things that we've seen in God's word or heard from the Lord that are to be shared with you and then forgotten about and we can all kind of go on with our, with our lives. We believe that we, what we share here over the next couple of weeks is who the Lord is calling us to be as a church. And because the church is the family and not a 501c3 organization, each and every one of us have an important part to play 
in what God is calling us to be and to do. So it's important that we are all on the same page. So we're going to take three weeks and talk about this. And the first thing I think the Lord would, would say to us right now, if you were to write us a letter, uh, the first thing we want to share about what we think God is calling us to be and do as a church is this. Nothing has changed. Now, when you look back over the last two years, this might sound ridiculous. Like, what do you mean that nothing has, has changed? Everything has changed over the last two years. It's been a, a whirlwind with COVID and social unrest and political upheaval. How can you say that nothing has changed? Well, when it comes to the fundamental core of who we are called to be and what we as a church are called to do and how we are called to do it, absolutely nothing has changed. In fact, nothing has changed for the last 2,000 years since Jesus ascended into heaven and gave us the Holy Spirit to empower our life together and to empower our witness in this world. <coughs> Sorry. Jesus has charged the church with making disciples, and that charge is still in effect today. So today we're going to dig into Scripture and see that the disciple-making mission that Jesus gave to us the disciple-making process that Jesus gave to us and the disciple-making essentials that Jesus gave to us are exactly the same. So in a very, very real sense, nothing has changed. So let's jump in. The disciple-making mission is the same as it was 2,000 years ago. Matthew chapter 28, look with me at verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus gave his followers one mission before he left earth. Make disciples. And that mission has been passed down from generation to generation of faithful Christ followers. And today, here in 2022, we are the stewards of that mission. Here at the start of the year, despite all of the ups and downs and despite all of the turmoil and despite what feels like shifting sand in our world, for the church, our mission has not changed. We are still called to be a church that makes disciples. The mission is exactly the same. But if we are going to be effective at making disciples, this mission that we have been given, we have to know what a disciple is. If we don't know what a disciple is, then we can't possibly hope to make one. Back in 2015, Tiffany and I took a couple uh, of leaders from our church to a discipleship conference in Dallas. We wanted to be uh, better, more effective disciple makers. And this was a disciple making conference. We thought it was going to be awesome. And uh, so on the first day, we get there to the conference and they, they had these breakout sessions. My friend Ben and I went to the pastor's breakout session and uh, they grouped a bunch of us at different tables together and started asking us questions about our discipleship strategy as a church and how we went about making disciples. What was our discipleship pipeline is what a lot of them like to talk about. And uh, then they said, okay, now we're going to take the next couple of minutes and we want you guys to answer two questions on your sheets of paper. Then we're going to share these answers. Here are the two questions. Number one, what is a disciple? Number two, how are disciples made? And this room full of pastors, seminary trained men, uh, men who had been serving the church for years and years, kind of looked around dumbfounded. And when we shared our answers just a little bit later, it became clear that 90% of the people in that room really didn't know what a disciple was. And outside of some canned programming or some curriculum, there weren't a lot of good ideas about how to make one. And if we as a church are going to be effective in the mission that Jesus has given to us, make disciples of all nations, we can't be fuzzy on this point. We have to know what a disciple is. So what is a disciple. I think we see an answer to that in Matthew chapter 4. So turn over there with me, Matthew chapter 4. This is where Jesus calls 
his first disciples. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, and the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. We've got a definition of disciple here at Lakeview Church that we've been using for the last couple of years. It's based on this verse. If I was there, I would quiz you on it, but unfortunately, I am not. But here's the definition of a disciple. A disciple is someone who is actually following Jesus, even if they're the last one in line, right? Like a disciple is not a super Christian or a Christian 2.0 or someone who desires to have leadership positions in the church. A disciple is someone who is actually following Jesus, even if they're a little bit rough around the edges. Like, praise God for that, right? Like, Jesus does not expect us all to be Bible scholars. He is not asking us to make Bible scholars when he asks us to make disciples. We are simply to follow Jesus and to bring others along as we do. That's what Jesus had in mind when he said, go make disciples of all nations. And that disciple-making mission is still exactly the same today. Not only is the disciple-making mission still the same today, but the disciple-making process is still exactly the same as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus modeled it for us. Now, we know what our mission is, and we know what we're trying to make as the church, that is, people who are actually following Jesus. How do we make one of those? How do we make a, a disciple? That second question that they asked at this conference. Well, there's really good news for us. The, the process of making disciples is no different than what Jesus modeled with his first disciples. Here at Lakeview Church, we call this, the pro this process the steps of discipleship. Step number one of, this, uh, of discipleship is this. Come to Jesus. Look with me at Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. As Jesus calls his first disciples, he lays all of his cards out on the table uh, from the very beginning with this, these guys. And, and in doing this, he actually gives us three steps whereby disciples are made. Verse 19. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The first step of discipleship is this. Come to Jesus. Jesus calls these men, and he says to them, Follow me. And this means more than, hey, follow me over here for a moment. I want to show you something. This is an invitation to a continual, daily, hourly, minute by minute following of Jesus, someone that they are to learn from. In the ancient context, uh, young Jewish men would have been very familiar with a rabbi calling disciples to follow after him. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, hey, come be my disciples. Come follow after me. Come take my life upon you. Come take what I know and do and take that on yourself. And they responded with a resounding yes. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who is actually following Jesus, someone who has said yes to the call of Jesus. Now, they, they may not be able to fully articulate the, the doctrine of the Trinity. They may not be able to uh, feel super comfortable in a church necessarily because they're not quite sure if they're doing things right, but they have dropped their nets to follow Jesus. That's how you become a follower of Jesus. That's how you become a disciple. There's a decisive moment when one decides to follow Jesus. They say yes to him when he says, follow me. But then there are a lifetime of moments after that when you have to continue to say yes to Jesus. Those moments when you're tired, those moments when you're tempted, those moments where you want to make decisions that aren't aligning with being a follower of Jesus, those are the moments where we continue to say yes, we continue to follow after him. We come to him decisively at our conversion when we turn from our sin and from self and decide to follow him, and we come to him daily as we walk this road with him. 
A disciple is someone who is actually, actively, intentionally following Jesus and saying yes to him. As we walk the road with Jesus, slowly but surely, we become more and more like Jesus. That's the the second step of discipleship. Become like Jesus. Notice in Matthew 4, 19, Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. Right off the bat, Jesus is letting these would-be followers know, you can, you can come to me just as you are. You can come to me smelling like fish, filthy from mending your nets, but you're not going to stay that way. I'm going to change you. He says he's going he's gonna to make all those who follow him into something different, into something different than what they currently are. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear on this point. We don't become like Jesus in order to be his disciple. There is no morality or good deeds test that you have to take before coming to Jesus, before saying yes to him. He doesn't say, follow me once you've kicked this or that addiction or stopped your habitual lying or made up for these really big, terrible things that you've done in your life. You have to go make up for those and then you can follow me. We don't clean ourselves up so that Uh, we can come to Jesus any more than we wash our car so that we can take it to the car wash. We, We come to Jesus and trust him to do the cleaning up that he wants to do in our lives. We come to him just as we are. And he promises us that if we follow him, he will change us. He will forgive us. He will give us a new heart to love what he loves and hate what he hates. He will change us from the inside out. A disciple is someone who is actually following Jesus, even if they're the last one in line. But if you follow Jesus, he will begin the process of changing your life, even if you are the one in the back. He will help you to love others with his love. He will create in you a distaste for the the sin patterns that used to sort of be your norm. They were your way of life. He'll change those. He'll give you a new and growing love and commitment to the Father. And uh, part of the change process, he's going to give you a desire and an ability to do the third step of discipleship, and that is to share Jesus with others. That's step number three. Jesus says he's going to make his followers into fishers of men. Now, for many of us, this conversation is fine and well until we get to this point of sharing Jesus with others, and all of a sudden it becomes very intimidating. I feel that, and and I'm a pastor. Sometimes I feel like it is easier to stand in front of you and preach a sermon, or in this case, to stand in front of a dumb cell phone and preach a sermon. But sometimes I feel like that's easier than going next door and sharing Jesus with my neighbors. There are oftentimes these obstacles in our, in our minds that stop us from actually sharing Jesus with others. And the first is this. We often don't know what to say. Like what, what are we going to say to someone? How do, we, how do we steer the conversation and explain the gospel? And we get wrapped up in the fear of, what if I do something wrong? What if I say something wrong? What if they ask a question that I can't answer? There's a lot we could say on this point, but the primary thing that I want us to hear is that in sharing Jesus with others, we simply fix our eyes on him. He has promised us that as we make disciples, He will be with us. It may be scary. It may uh, create anxiety in us. We may have fear and worry that we're going to mess it up or say the wrong thing. But if we simply trust him to be with us, then he will show up and he will use those moments to bring others to himself. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be the next Billy Graham, but I believe that if we will make ourselves available to the Lord, And if we will be obedient to his call, he will use us to draw people to himself. The second obstacle that we often get get caught up with uh, is that we've made sharing Jesus with others into something I don't think it has to be. Like we think about sharing Jesus with others as sort of the the cold call strategy, right? It's got to be the person on the elevator, the guy next to you on the airplane, or the waitress or waiter at the restaurant. When I was in seminary, I had to take a class called personal evangelism. We had to go into the neighborhood behind the school and knock on doors and share the gospel with anybody that wouldn't slam a door in our face. 
Now, uh, for the Southern Baptist professors who had grown up in a different cultural era, that model of evangelism may have been very effective. But I have to say, it wasn't very effective for us. Now, I think we should share the gospel with our servers at restaurants or with people on the elevator or with people on the airplane. And by all means, if knocking on doors, going door to door, sharing the gospel with people is your thing, then by all means, please go and do that because I don't feel like that is my own personal gifting. But I also think that evangelism and sharing Jesus with others has to be within reach of those who aren't extroverts, those who aren't uh, comfortable doing that kind of thing. In fact, I think it's it's attainable for people even like me and even like you. Think about it. Is there a is there a friend or a coworker that you go to lunch with regularly? Is there someone who you have coffee with on a regular basis? Are there people in your circle that need to know Jesus? That's low hanging fruit. Capitalize on those relationships and see what Jesus does in those. One of the best places I've found to share the gospel uh, here in Stoughton is actually at the the Stoughton Splash Pad. Uh, Last summer, my kids and I would go there on the same day every week, right around the same time, and we kept running into the same people week after week after week. And the next thing you know, conversations start happening. And then after that, finally, I was talking to a, a young lady who was a single mom, and she'd grown up in the church, and she had gone far from the Lord at this point in her life, and, but she wanted her son to be raised in the church. And she said, I just feel like I'm too far gone at this point to come back. Like, I feel like I'm too disconnected from the church. And I was able to share with her, no, no matter how many steps you've taken away from Jesus, you're only one step to get back to him. And, you know, beautiful opportunities like that will arise if we'll just have conversations with people, if we'll, we'll just talk with people. We don't need big, crazy programs or a slide in the foyer for the kids or smoke machines for the young adults or the best church-facilitated luncheons for retirees. What we need to be faithful in making disciples is conversations with people who will never step foot in this building on their own, uh, of their own choosing. They'll never choose to step foot into this building. The disciple-making mission of the church is still the same even after all these years. And the simple steps that Jesus modeled in his ministry, come to Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus with others, is the exact same process whereby disciples are made today, just like 2,000 years ago. Now the big question, what do we need to make disciples? What does it take? What are the essential ingredients for making disciples? My son Sutton, he he loves Legos. Uh, The more complicated the thing is to build, the the more he likes it. But there's a problem. He is only five, and that means his skills are somewhat limited. So uh, what he really likes is for dad to build Legos with him. I'm not very good at it, but but I do like getting down on the floor with him and building. One of the most frustrating things for me, though, not so much for him, he kind of digs it, one of the most frustrating things for me is when we grab an old instruction book that came with a set and we sit down to build something and I can see uh, what the end product is, uh, what it's supposed to be, what it's supposed to look like, and I can see the steps that I need to follow to, to get it all together and to, to make this thing, but I can't find the pieces that I need to complete it. When it comes to making disciples, now we know at this point what the end product is supposed to look like. It's, it is someone who is actually following Jesus in their daily lives. And we know the steps that we need to follow to get there. Come to Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus with others. But now, what are the necessary ingredients? What are the pieces that we need to make this thing happen? An entire industry has been built to answer this question. Churches and church resourcing companies have uh, marketed programs and curriculum and evangelism scripts and big church blowouts that attract the masses or at least are supposed to. And each one of them promises, if you follow this method, 
if you just do this model, if you do it just like this, you'll be a success. But as I look at the American church today, I don't see a groundswell of spiritually mature disciples of Jesus invading the world with the good news of the kingdom, like coming out of all of these programs, out of all of this stuff that the church is doing. In fact, I see an assembly line that is creating consumers that merely serve to feed the machine that we've created. The early church had no curriculum. They had no scripts. They had no massive buildings. They had no hip pastors adorned with uh, the latest fashion. I know you guys are lucky you get pastors who dress super nice, but uh, the, the point is that the early church fared quite well with none of this stuff. And after 2,000 years, the ingredients for making disciples is exactly the same today. Nothing has changed. What we need to make disciples today is the same thing they needed 2,000 years ago. So what are the ingredients for making the disciples? Number one, the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God falls on the people of God in a new way, and He manifests Himself, not only in the miraculous, but in transformed lives and in the way that the early church and the early believers cared for one another. The world around them saw this, and people flocked by the thousands to the church and began to follow Jesus. If we go about trying to make disciples in our own power without dependence on the Holy Spirit, all of our efforts will accomplish nothing. It will be for naught. But with the Holy Spirit, that dynamic and powerful life of God will erupt among us. It will empower all that we do. And if we have the Holy Spirit working in our midst, we can have great confidence that God is going to uh, accomplish what he wants to accomplish and nothing can stop him. If the Holy Spirit is working in and among us, disciples will be made. Second ingredient that is needed for making disciples, we need the word of God. The early church had the Old Testament and uh, also the message of Jesus, the message of the gospel. And when that word was proclaimed, in the power of the Holy Spirit, hearts were transformed, lives were changed, people began following after Jesus. That is why this book is so important for us here at Lakeview Church. Today we have both the Old and New Testament, the fullness of God's revelation, and as we submit ourselves to this word, God draws people to himself. He transforms us. He shapes our hearts, and he equips us as disciple makers. So everything that we do revolves around this word. We will always have the word of God in our gathering and in our midst together. The third and final ingredient that is necessary for making disciples is the people of God. It's those people sitting right around you. Like you are an essential part of the disciple making process. It's through this collective that we are encouraged and challenged and held accountable and cared for and called up and equipped and emboldened on the path of following Jesus. We have an essential part to play in one another's lives and in the process of making disciples. Without each other, we simply cannot do this. The Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the people of God, all three coming together, that's what the early church had. No buildings, no money, no curriculum, no tax-exempt status, no marketing, no internet, right? And they changed the world. And today, nothing has changed. If we have the Spirit of God, if we have the Word of God, if we have the people of God, we have all that we need to make disciples. Our job is simply to create opportunities where these three ingredients, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God, are brought together intentionally and when that happens, we will see God drawing people to himself. We'll see God growing us in our faith. And we'll see disciples being made all around us. So, our mission has not changed. It is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded us. Not only is our mission the same, but the process is exactly the same. 
Jesus came and he said to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That is, come to Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus with others. That is the, the process and the ingredients that we need for making these disciples of Jesus. We need the Spirit of God. We need the Word of God. We need each other. We need the church. You put all of this together and disciples will and are being made here at Lakeview Church. I am so grateful for this time that I've had with you. Sorry again that I cannot be there with you, but let me close in prayer. Father, I am grateful today for your love, for you sustaining me and my family through this, uh, through COVID, and thankful, Lord, for uh, what you are doing at Lakeview Church. Would you give us great faith as we look forward to what you are calling us to? Lord, help us to remember that nothing has changed when it comes to making disciples. It is still our mission. You are still empowering it. So Lord, help us to be faithful. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to take some time to respond to that sermon. If you would just stand and sing with us.
Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, um, Holy Spirit, for your empowerment. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for this fellowship of believers that we have, that we can live every moment of our lives with purpose. Father, we do ask for your help um, to be courageous and bold and stand in your truth. We ask for the strength to be patient and kind. We pray that we would really display who you are to everyone that we come in contact with, Lord. Let us lift your name high in everything that we do. Father, we thank you this morning um, that we are here and that we are healthy. And we just pray that you would bless Josh's family with the gift of health. We thank you that despite being sick, your word was still preached. We give you glory for that. And we pray that you would continue to keep the rest of our church family safe. We love you. And we love being your kids. And we are learning how to love one another better and better each day. Bless us now as we go. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your day. Go in the love and peace of God. <laughs>